Divine Truth Assistance Group. Group assistance sessions putting principles of divine truth into action. This recording is from the Developing My Loving Self group and is part of an Education in Love series. In the creation of my pain presentation, Jesus examines the will-based choice to sin that we individually and society collectively made in the past and continue making that create and maintain the emotional and physical pain that now exists inside of us. Recorded on the 4th of June, 2016, in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. Okay, well now we come to the first uh, talk that we would like to give to you about the subject of developing my loving self, and that is the creation of my pain. How did my pain get created? What actually happened? So this is what we want to focus our, our attention on. So what we want to do is firstly look at uh, the sources of our pain. And after that, we'll be looking at some things about the causes of pain and the types of pain. But let's focus our attention first on the source of pain. Now, what did we learn in our first group with regard to pain and pleasure? What was the primary cause of pain? If we go to Lani, thanks. Who's got our mic for us? Thanks. Thanks. Uh, with sin. Sin, yes. So let's be more specific. What is sin? So what, what is sin? If we go to Kerry, okay, okay, thanks. I'm missing the mark in, in love. Missing the mark in love, but whose mark? How does the mark get measured? God's. So it's God's mark. So what are we really saying, what sin is? We're really saying that sin is, if we come down to Dennis. Uh, I'm out of harmony with God's view and love. Yes, but what determines that? What is it, how is God's view enforced in the universe we have? It's by law, isn't it? Yes. So basically what we're saying is that we're choosing to do things out of harmony with God's laws. That's what we're saying. So sin is all of those things. So you could say out of harmony with love, but, but it's good to be specific about law here because when we come to our third group and we start looking at law and what's going on with law, we'll see the relationship between why, why it's classified sin being out of harmony with law. Um, with God's laws, not with man's laws. So we could say sin is the source of pain. And the sin being out of harmony with God's law. Every time we're out of harmony with God's law, we've sinned. Every time we sin, it's unloving from God's perspective, not, not necessarily from our own, but God's. And remember I, in the previous discussion we had with you in the introduction, we said that God's laws operate upon the emotional feelings of, of our condition, not upon what we do. So this starts telling you that sin is often engaged even without taking an action. It's about having the feeling that is out of harmony with the law. And God's laws are all about correcting our feelings out of harmony with God's laws. Right? So it's one of the reasons for the operation of God's laws, which we'll talk about in our third group. You know, the one about God's laws in the third group, you're going to find that fascinating. Really fascinating. You might not understand it for 10 years afterwards, but you <laughs> should find it fascinating. Okay, so source of pain. Now let's, let's be more specific about this source of pain. Firstly, it begins with my sin, my personal sin. God doesn't uh, you know, attribute things to you that, that actually somebody else did. God focuses on what? You know, all of God's laws focus on what you have done. So it's you're sinning in, in three primary areas, I suppose you could say. Firstly, it's your relationship.
with God. Now, this is a very interesting thing that most people don't consider. They don't consider that not having a relationship with God is actually a sin. But it is. In fact, it's the largest sin. The reason why it's the largest sin is because if you have a relationship with God, you get these infinite benefits from that relationship. So if you now reject having a relationship with God, those benefits won't happen. So it's actually the worst thing you can do for yourself to not have a relationship with God. It's actually the worst thing you can do. Now, for most of humankind, that's not what we believe. We believe that relationship with God, not having a relationship with God, well, God barely influences our life. So why, you know, how can you say it's the worst sin when, you know, at the end of the day, surely it doesn't matter that much. God doesn't really care anyway. But this is all of our definitions of love now that are being spoken of. And that brings us to our second part, the way that we sin, and that is our view of love. So a flawed view of love. We have a flawed view of God's love. We have a flawed view of our own love. We have a flawed view of what love is. We, we often engage behaviours that we think are love. And, and then from God's perspective, we find out that, well, that was actually sin. And so we've just got this flawed view of love. And that, that's one of the things that creates a lot of our sin. In fact, a large part of our sin is created by our flawed view of love. Because we think we're being loving. So we run around doing a whole things we think are good while at the same time doing, while engaging them and, and feeling them, is actually out of harmony with love. You see? And this is where, where it's confusing for us. It's one of the major areas of our sin. And it's not an area of your sin that you'll probably understand very well for many years. The very hardest thing that almost every spirit who passes from this earth to the spirit world, the hardest things for them to address are the things where they chose to do what they thought was the loving thing only to find out later that it was a sin. Very difficult. So our flawed view of love causes us huge amounts of problems. We think we're doing the right thing when, from God's perspective, we're doing the wrong thing. And... and God doesn't force us to give up our concept. God's laws are trying to correct their concept, but God doesn't force us to give up the concept. Giving up false definitions of love are about how we use our will. That's up to us. That's what we've created. We need to remove it. You see, God's not going to remove it unless you want it removed. The other thing that's flawed is our flawed <coughs> view of truth. Flawed definition of what truth is. So that's my sin. My sin involves these three things. Now, of course, my flawed view of truth has a large effect. Now, if you think about it, it's very. In our first group, we talked a lot about the comparison between things that that are truth from God's perspective, like you know the law of gravity, a truth from God's perspective, law, the law of aerodynamics, a truth from God's perspective. It's mathematically defined. We can measure it. In any, any law of the universe is, is mathematically defined and can be measured. Right? Wonderful. But, but when it, So we, we, we recognise that on a physical level. With science in particular, many of you have mobile phones that you're using, some of you are even using devices, and all of those devices operate on laws. Many of them operate on hundreds of different laws in one device nowadays. Hundreds of different laws had to be discovered before that device could be created. Right? And they're all predictable every single time. And it's only the software <laughs> that seems to be not that predictable, the human part of it, that makes it less predictable. But the actual law is predictable every time. They can manufacture something, and as long as it engages the law, it works. Right? So we, we, we underestimate the importance of truth in our lives even now. We don't realise that every single moment of our lives, every device we use, is all engaging aspects of God's truth predictably and with consistency. 
But, but we don't apply that to the human soul. We don't apply that to the human condition. We only apply it to physical things. And that's part of our flawed definition of truth that we need to understand. So my sin is created. My being out of harmony with God's laws is created by these particular things. Okay. Now, of course, before I sinned, my parents sinned. And before my parents sinned, their parents sinned. And before their parents sinned, their parents sinned. Right? And you could say that society collectively sins because society collectively does things out of harmony with law. So society collectively doesn't understand what a relationship with God is. Society collectively has a flawed view of love. Society collectively has a flawed view of what the truth is. My parents have the same issue, have a flawed view of their relationship with God, have a flawed view of love and a flawed view of truth. So, so of course, we now need to add to my sin, which is, by the way, the primary source of pain, these other secondary causes of those that source which are related to my parents or you could say my family of origin origin my parents sin and and i suppose i should use it as a plural and society sin all create pain for me that's the sources of my pain It's very important to understand that the primary source of pain is my own choice. Many of you have been thinking that it's your parents. And that's not necessarily true. A person can be brought up in a very damaging environment and choose with the exercise of their will to not be or I'll say, instead of saying two negatives, I'll say choose with the exercise of their will to be loving. And they avoid unloving acts. And then there's people who have been brought up in a really nice environment. Example, the first human couple. And they chose with the exercise of their will to be unloving, to break God's laws. And in fact, they chose to break the biggest of God's laws, which we talked about was the relationship with God laws, which of course had a large, large impact upon the rest of human society. So what do we learn from these, these things? We learn that our source of pain comes primarily from these three things. Now, at this stage, most of us do not understand the significance of this. We're not, we, we have not yet had enough experience with seeing the relationship and feeling the relationships to understand the significance of what's just been said. Uh, and so this is something that you will discover over time as you come to feel your pain. But see, the majority of us are not feeling our pain. We are in denial of feeling our pain. We're trying to avoid feeling our pain. We're trying to suppress our pain. We're trying to deny it even exists. And because of that, we don't understand that the majority of our pain is related to these three things. Once you truly feel your pain, you will come to see that those three things are the primary sources of your pain. Does that make sense? But you'll only come to see it once you've done it. It's not something you'll see before then. Okay. So, any questions about that before I move on? Joy, we'd like to come down. Thank you. Um, you described the um, sorry. You described the sin of not having a relationship with God as unforgivable. Mm -hmm. um, what does that mean? Just until I do have a relationship with God? Yes. But while you're choosing to not have a relationship with God, then no relationship with God can ever be established, right? Because that's the exercise of your will. As a result of that, it's unforgivable while you engage that sin. It's only once you repent of that sin, or you could say 
decide to change that, decide to change the fact that now I do want a relationship with God, that, that sin can be forgiven. Does that make sense? And just making the decision to change automatically repents or I need to repent for... Well, you Not need to go through the process of repentance, okay. Okay. which is a completely process which we'll be discussing probably in a couple of years' time, in more full, <laughs> <laughs> more fully. But, but in this program, I mean. Okay. But, uh, but the reality is, I've already introduced those kind of topics to you in yep. the past, so you can sort of see what is involved. But yep. it goes; it requires more than just thinking. Oh, I'm going to change that, doesn't it? Because there's feelings inside of you that cause that to occur that have to be addressed. Thank Remember you. the feelings that we looked at in the very first day of the very first group, the feelings that we have about love and God's love, they have a very large impact on our ability to change that. Yeah. Okay, so if we go to Sandra on this side. So when you were talking about um, that, that be being the biggest sin, not having a relationship with God and because of the benefits, mm -hmm. is it because it is out of harmony uh, with love of self? Yeah, it's hugely out yeah. of harmony with love of self. Um, and in fact, in fact, there is a limit of your development if you choose to not have a relationship with God. You're actually limiting yourself quite severely by not having a relationship with God. And every spirit who's done that, limited their relationship with God, finishes their development in the sixth sphere of the spirit world. When there are actually 36 spheres they could be moving to, they've limited their development. So, so this tells you that obviously the limitation is a self-imposed limitation. To go beyond the sixth sphere requires a relationship with God. So, so if you're not going to have a relationship with God, you're purposefully limiting your own development sad eh? so because god loves us so much and the universe is based on love that's why because it's all about love like basically so god's like well if you yeah i kind of so god's saying you can it. choose to ignore me if you want yeah. but by choosing to ignore me you impose upon yourself a whole heap of limitations and they're self-imposed and they're breaking God's law. They're breaking God's biggest laws. They're all the biggest laws are, so, are associated with development of love in the human soul, receiving love from God, and the transformation of the human soul. So, so they're actually breaking, breaking God's biggest laws. So therefore, they're a sin. Remember, we said sin is any time we're out of harmony with God's laws. It doesn't matter which one. So you know, you could choose to jump off a building. You're out of harmony with the law of gravity. It's a sin from God's perspective. If you chose to jump off. If you were pushed off, it was somebody else's sin. If you jumped off with a uh, you know, hang glider on your back, then you haven't sinned because you're engaging a higher law. So you'll fly off and you'll be probably okay. Unless you break that law, you'll be fine. Do you see? And, and this applies to all of God's laws including the God's highest laws, which relate to our relationship with God. Yep. Okay, well, let's move on to the next point we want to make, and that is, that's the source of pain. So what are the causes of pain? And in this area here, we want to basically, so we talked about sin being the cause of pain, which is still true, and we talked about my sin and the relationship with God, but let's focus more of our attention on these particular two things. Flawed view of love and a flawed viewpoint of truth. Now, these are the primary causes also of our pain. Now, they're a cause of pain in the three areas, in three primary areas. And the three primary areas are, firstly, our relationship with God. Secondly, our relationship with self. And thirdly, our relationship with others. And you could add fourth, fifth, our relationship with the environment and so forth uh, as things go down. But they're the primary causes of our pain. So, so, And if you think about it um, in terms of your own happiness, can you see that when there's a problem in your relationship with your, your best friend, your partner, 
it does hurt the most, doesn't it? And it's the, something that bothers you all the time. You feel bad about it all the time. You feel like it's got to get addressed and it's not getting addressed and you feel frustrated and annoyed. It much makes you angry more than anything else. It makes you sad more than anything else. So you can see how relationships have a large bearing on your happiness. And of course, obviously flaws in the relationship is going to have a large bearing on the opposite of your happiness, your sadness. Right? So it's our relationship with God. So it's not only our relationship with God, but we have a flawed perspective of God's love of us and we have a flawed perspective of our love of God. With, re with regard to ourselves, we have a flawed perspective of our own love of self and we have a flawed perspective of other people's love of themselves. Right? And when it comes to others, we have a flawed perspective of my love for others and we have a flawed perspective of what they should do to love me. So you can see it's a to and from issue with regard to each relationship that causes our unhappiness. It's both sides. Alex, you'd like to ask? I'm just reading the outline. I struggled with understanding the difference. Oh, sorry. Yeah, the guys can't see you. Um, sorry, Connie, I couldn't see you. <laughs> um, I, I couldn't understand the difference between the cause of pain and the source of pain. The source of pain is about all about your choice to sin. The cause of pain is about these flawed viewpoints of love and truth and what they do to you and how they generate pain. So like false, false beliefs that you've imbibed? Yes, you could say these are false beliefs or false definitions of love and these are false beliefs, false definitions of what is true. Does that make sense? So, th so these two things have a very large bearing on how much pain you're actually in without being aware. They have a large bearing on how much pain you're in. Now, how much you have a flawed definition of love and truth is how much you sin. And so the more you sin, the more pain there will be. So the primary source of pain is sin, the desire to sin, but the causes of the pain are a lot to do with how much we're out of harmony with love and out of, out of harmony with truth from God's definition. Does that make sense? And, and don't get too hung up, on, Alex, on source versus cause. Yeah. They were just two terminologies that I'm trying to use to separate how one's more of an internal state and the other is what the internal state looks like, like wh why it's the source of pain. Yeah, I struggle with the intellectual stuff sometimes. Yeah, I just yeah. want to feel it. <laughs> yeah. um, come down to Pat. Thanks. <clears throat> Are all these flawed views of love, flawed views of truth, basically fear-driven? Is it basically all fear? No, ironically, they cause fear. Mm. Learn that. They cause fear. Yeah. Most of the reasons why you're afraid is because you don't know the truth and you can't feel love. That's why you're afraid. In your relationships, you think about it, whenever you get afraid in your relationship, it's because you can't feel that the other person loves you. If you could feel they loved you, it wouldn't matter what they said to you, would it? You would be able to feel that they loved you and therefore you wouldn't be afraid. You see? But if you can't feel they love you, that's what causes a lot of your pain. You know, it causes a feeling it's the same with truth um, truth causes your fear so for example one truth is that you never die but for the majority of us we don't necessarily believe that really in our heart we don't believe that we're afraid of dying we're afraid of going through the process of dying we're afraid of what we might lose and so we have a whole heap of fears none of which are true from God's perspective but because we believe them they cause us to believe they're true and then as a result of that, they generate fear. So most of our fears are generated from these two sources. Interesting, huh? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. You can see why they're so important to address. You know, these, the pain causes these things to be created. So now we're talking about this, the false beliefs and false definitions of love. This is exactly what we're speaking about here in this, in this diagram here. So our pain generates all these false beliefs and false definitions of love and that creates fear. 
Yeah. It's interesting when you realize that. Because then you start realizing that all fear that's inside of me has been created by false definitions of love and false definitions of truth. Right? So you can see that to get rid of fear, the antidote is <laughs> truth and love. love. Real love and real truth. Yeah. So, you know, when we understand that, it, it makes a big, has, has a big effect on our lives. The beauty of understanding how my pain got created is that I can then start to uh, understand how, to, uh, how undoing my pain will help me. You see? See, how undoing pain helps you is that it helps destroy the false beliefs and the false definitions of love. And that destroys, once they are destroyed, all of your fear is destroyed. Isn't that great? Yeah, so, so you can see once all your fear is destroyed, now you're in a state where you love without being afraid. So yeah, most people think my fear creates my things. These things create my fear. These things... So it's the opposite to what most of us believe. These things create my fear. Okay, so that's the causes of my pain. Now, now let's examine the types of pain that we have created as a result of these two primary problems, which, which on our diagram, and, and you've got a printout of your diagram. Most of you would have got a printout. In your diagram, that's this section now that's above your pain. So this has now been created by my refusal to release pain causes me to define things now in a completely different way. I now define things completely back to front from God's perspective. We define things evil instead of love now. Does that make sense? And, and that defini these definitions come from the pain that we've not released. They come from the pain we've stored very important to understand that that the the, the these these things that cause my pain they, they cause my pain the feeling of pain but they also are a part of the driving force that drives everything above as well right. they also cause us to sin again right so it's a very the the unfortunate thing about everything about your pain is this if you refuse to release your pain, this monster gets created. And now not only do we need to release our pain, but we need to actually address a whole heap of other things as well. And that all comes from just not allowing pain, not allowing pain as a feeling without acting upon it. Now it's going to take you time to get to the point where you can allow pain as a feeling without taking action. Accepting pain and releasing pain is going to take time and, and that's why we're going to talk about it on the fourth day. What we want to do now is understand how it will get created and, and have some compassion for how it all got created. And you're going to need that before you can accept it and start deconstructing it. Okay, so let's look at the types of pain now that uh, have been created. And now you can see these in your outline, so perhaps you want to step through them. Who would like to just read out the first one for me? Um, the first type of pain that got, has got created, right up the back. Mike, is it? Yep. No, no, someone's saying it. Feeling God does not want, does not want, no, reject me? Yes, so this is all about God, right? So God rejects me. Let's put it as rejects me does not want to know me, whatever. Why, why, how is that a type of pain? Well, as you can see, one of our primary causes of pain is our false definitions of love in the area of our relationship with God. So, so, and, and if our relationship with God or a lack of such is the highest sin we can commit, then as a result of being the highest sin we can commit, it's also the result of the majority of our quite deepest and darkest emotions. Right? 
Now, you imagine for a moment, if you could feel God loves you every moment of every single hour of every single day, you imagine that for a moment, that the highest being in the universe loves you, has made a safe world for you to live in, safe universe for you to engage. You understood the laws because of it. Can you see that you would have no pain? No, like, all of you could treat me badly, and what would happen? It's like water off a duck's back, as the saying goes. Isn't it? Just flows away because God, the most important being in the universe, loves me. I don't need you to love me anymore. Now, you take away God's love, and what do you got? You got only human love left, have you not? And humans sometimes love you and sometimes don't. And sometimes it comes from one person. Sometimes they love you and sometimes they don't. Sometimes they hate your guts. Sometimes they're unpredictable. Sometimes they love you one moment and the next moment they're trying to attack you. So can you see how not having that safety with God now creates a whole heap of panic and fear and so forth? Yeah? So it's the primary cause of a lot of our pain without us realising most of us go around merrily going, oh, I don't need God. It's not fine to not have a relationship with God. It's not that important. I need to sort out my relationship with my partner or my friends or whatever. When actually if you had a relationship with God, you wouldn't need your relationship with your partner or your friends to be sorted out. You'd be a lot more patient about sorting out those relationships. You wouldn't get so insistent. You wouldn't do things that actually attack them and harm them, trying to get them to change. Because you're already loved by God. You don't need their love. You might want it, but you don't need it. You don't, you're not driven by the vortex of these sucking addictions. You know, this, you know, give me this, give me this feeling. So, give me, give me, give me, you know. You're not driven by that because you're in a safe and secure place with God. You see, it has a large effect, right? So without us knowing it, we, we've got this pain inside of us and the majority of us are in complete denial of this pain. It's one of our primary pains and yet the majority of us have never touched it, never connected to it. It's, it's the pain that got established at the very beginning of life here on earth, millennia ago. This whole concept about God's treatment of me, God's rejection of me, God not caring for me, God not wanting me, and those kind of feelings. So that, that's a large source of my pain. What's next? If we go to Sharon. <coughs> uh, feeling like I want to reject God. Yeah, so this is sort of the opposite part of the, re the relationship, isn't it? In rejecting God, we don't, we don't understand what we're doing, you know. Because we've never had a relationship with God, we have nothing to measure it by, right, or the, of what we're actually rejecting. But, but we're actually rejecting infinite progression. We're rejecting a soul union condition with our soulmate and the happiness that that brings. We're rejecting ever becoming a celestial angel. We're rejecting the process of our development beyond the sixth dimension. We're, re we're rejecting... All of our, the potential of all of our relationships uh, really being much deeper. We're rejecting pretty much the majority of God's truth. And remember, God's truth are all law based, so we're rejecting the majority of God's laws. We're rejecting knowledge, information from God, because God's the one who gives us an education about the whole universe, so we're rejecting that. And is it no wonder after rejecting all those things that we're not very happy? which is the cause of our pain, right? Yep, Yvonne? Um, how do the six fear spirits suppress and deal with that amount of pain and think that they're okay? Like Same way we do. <laughs> Same way we do. By denying it's there completely. By busying themselves, doing a whole lot of enjoyable things hoping that at one point this 
feeling that's inside of them, this feeling of dissatisfaction that they can't identify goes away at some point in the future by them finding something that they really enjoy. And so they have what they call a happy life, doing a whole, whole leap of what they call happy things, um. but rejecting God and therefore rejecting the majority of the pain that that relationship, you know, the majority of that, the way in which that relationship would give them a whole lot of blessings is now not available to them. So they're rejecting it. Because they, they would have wrongful definitions of their views of love and truth would yes. also be not from God. In, in regard to God. Yeah. It's all in regard to God that they have the wrong definition of love, a flawed definition of love and a flawed definition of God's love, a flawed definition of God's truth. Yep, definitely. That's why it's one of the biggest things you can do to yourself that harms you. <laughs> Doing that, rejecting God, is one of the biggest things you can do to yourself. Causes a, a large amount of personal harm. Yep. Eagle? Uh, AJ, I've got two, if I may. So every time we pray to God, and there's no answer, and the feeling of rejection comes up, that's the answer from God. Yeah, that's me believing this. So therefore, there's a whole heap of things I need to release, pain associated with that. Yep. Um, and, Sorry, and, he's, he's and, just switching. Yes. <laughs> and also, do you have to have some amount of genuine love towards God when you pray to actually receive an answer. Yes, remember, all of God's laws operate on my feelings, my feelings. So the highest laws of love operate on my feelings. So if I don't have a genuine feeling of love for God, then of course God's not going to feel that I love God. Can you see that? And if I'm blocked to receiving God's genuine feelings for me, then I'm not going to feel God loves me. Big issue, eh? Yeah. And we don't realise how much pain it causes. We think that the rest of the list is what causes our pain. Uh, and not those two things. That, but those two things have caused the, the large majority of our pain. In fact, what I'm working through now emotionally is the, is the large majority of my pain that I've had all this life. And both of them relate to those two things. All the, all, of the, all the pain I'm going through at the moment relates to those two things. Can we move on to the next one? What's the next one? If we come down to Rachel. That others don't want to know me or reject me. Okay, so now we're saying, now we're looking more completely, aren't we, at the same two things as this. So I could almost go like this now, couldn't I? I could go... That, that, others reject me and I reject others. In other words, my relationship with others is now, now a primary cause of my sadness or a primary cause of my pain. And you can see that, right? You can see that when you feel rejected by others, you feel pain. And when you feel that, uh, and when you reject others, they feel pain. Obviously, that causes them pain, and also yourself some. Uh, so, you can see that these two things obviously have a large bearing on the amount of pain I have. And if we think about others, we, we're talking about not only others with regard to our friends or our family, but even just others in society. You know, you go to school and you get rejected by someone you hardly even know. And it does often trigger some pain, doesn't it? Now, of course, if I had my relationship with God nice and firm and secure, and others could do that and it probably wouldn't have any effect on me, right? But because I haven't got my relationship with God secure, others do that and it's huge. Like, I'm devastated by it, you see? So that is a type of pain that I have. What's next after that? If we come down to, yeah, just go straight across, is it uh, Marion? Yeah. 
feeling lower or inferior to others. Yes, so now we're looking at um, our relationship with others a bit more specifically and we're examining it from the perspective of how I feel in relationship to others. Now, obviously, there's two things here, isn't there? There's a positive in terms of I... Or, well, I don't know if it's positive, but there's a I feel greater than others or I feel lesser than others. So we're going to talk here about the inferiority feeling first and then the superiority feeling, which will actually cause pain as well. So there's the inferiority emotions and then there's the superiority emotions that obviously are going to be a source of pain for me and also pain for others right you know if i treat if i say i'm superior to you that obviously makes you feel lesser and then it makes you feel worse and if you haven't got a relationship with god which would say no that's not true then you might believe that and if you believe that then you'll obviously feel pain about that now there must be a reason why you believe it but that goes back to your parents and society sin in your childhood and what they caused you to believe and therefore you accept it right okay so these two emotions inferiority and superiority so so can you see when you're releasing pain you sometimes have to release pain associated with feeling better than others the majority of us don't do that we only release pain associated with feeling worse than others right. but from God's perspective better or worse is not equal and the only way that we're not going to have pain in our relationship with others is that we all actually have a feeling inside of ourselves that we're equal right and that means in your relationship equal <laughs> You have a baby brought into the world and you you have you know you get together and have sex and have a baby the baby's equal to you most of you don't treat your children like that you treat them like you you own them which is not equal does that make sense can you see why the child now believes it's not equal to its parents and then the parents might go but my child is more important than your child so what does that do they feel they're not equal they're inferior to their parents but they are superior to other children so now we get flavors of superiority and inferiority based around the way in which the parents have acted because the parents haven't treated the child as equal you see Big, big source of pain on the planet, huge source of pain. People go to war for that. You know, you kill my child, I'll go to war for, with you about that. My child, your child, not equal. <laughs> you killing my child doesn't justify me killing yours because that would be you, you, being, you treating my child as if it's not equal to yours is just as bad as me treating your child as if it's not equal to mine problems okay it's a type of pain big big source of pain what's next Dennis down the front here <coughs> satisfying addictions of myself and others at all costs yes so let's look at addictions addictions and this is addictions of, from myself to others and from others to me so both both satisfying both is a problem addictions are like a great big vortex of holes inside of our soul so if you can think of your soul i just draw it like that and imagine parts of your soul has vortex like, like sucking in you know like and then there's then there's other vortexes that are going out right <laughs> out of you and they're like vortexes go out of you into other you know where they're sucking and you're giving right so i'm <laughs> give me give me <laughs> you know and they're going <laughs> give me give me and i and i give them certain things they want as long as i get the things i want 
right? Now, without us understanding, we, we're thinking we're satisfying pain. We, we, we're making our pain go away. Isn't it pretty? Like, we, we're going, oh, I'll make that better for you. <laughs> That's what we're doing. That's what we think we're doing. Right? But what are we really doing? We're, we're continuing the whole in that person. So their pain is going to live longer. And if they do it to us, they're continuing the whole inside of us. And so that pain will live longer. It'll never be satisfied until that whole is healed. Right? Now this is why it's, you know, people have asked me plenty of times, like, you know, why isn't it you, you aren't healing others yet? And there's a very simple answer. Because I have not healed myself yet. You see that? If I haven't healed myself yet, it's impossible to help another be healed. Right? We, we need to heal ourselves first. Now, I learned that very early in my first century life. That's why it took until I was 31 years of age before I did anything that got recorded. Because before then, I was healing myself. Doing all the changes and adjustments and getting God's definition of love and truth to the point where I could become at one with God first. Right? And then could heal others. You wanted to ask, Suze? I know what the question is already, but you can ask. It. <laughs> okay. How, how would it be possible for you to actually heal somebody else? Well, it's not you that heals. It's God that heals through you. So you need to get to the point where you're connected to God completely, and then God's energy can flow through you to other people. Is that not true? No, that wasn't what I meant. If it's each person's responsibility mm -hmm. to go through the process of understanding their own pain. Yeah, but God doesn't want you to drag that process out for millennia. God, if, if someone is around who can help you, God would obviously feel like, they'd like that he would like those persons to help you. Can you see that? Wouldn't that be an act of love? No, yeah, I can see that. Yep. So how would that actually take place? Like if there's By you having some faith that it can occur. Right. That's all it needs. Raises your condition. You have a will exercise to allow it to occur. Then it can occur. So if you wanted to be, if you were blind and you wanted to be healed with your sight, if someone was around who was had God's flow of love doing that, they'd be able to heal yourself as long as you wanted to, and you were willing to address the emotional blockages you have as to why the sight got damaged. Now, some of those blockages weren't even created by you. Oh, okay. Were they? They were created by parents or successive generations. Right. So that can all be healed. So they would be specific injuries, not necessarily the injuries from your own choices. Correct. Because yeah. they have to be undone by, firstly, you being undoing your own choices. Choices, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so addictions have a big part to play in your pain. The pain. You can see up here, now, now we're up here with addictions. It's driving our desire for comfort and satisfaction, is driving our behaviour, and it drives our behaviour to do unloving things from God's perspective. We do them thinking that it's the, it'll give us or others comfort and satisfaction. The reality is when we don't do them too, we get angry and frustrated and enraged in many cases. We do some very, very damaging things in that place. We attack others, abuse others, pull them down, try to destroy them. We do a whole heap of terrible things in that place just because of these, these <laughs> addictions, you know, thinking that satisfying them or satisfying somebody else's addictions is going to be the way forward when actually it, it causes a lot of our pain. So what's next? Uh, if we go right back there, just behind. Sorry, I can't, I can't remember your name. What is your name? Laura. Laura. Yeah. Do you need to stand, Laura? Can the guy see you? No, all right. Okay. Uh, accepting lies as truth from others or lying to self, others and God. Say that again for me. Accepting lies as truth. Yes. 
uh, from others or lying to self, Correct. others and so God. So here we're talking about the issue of lies, aren't we? So lies, and we're talking about the acceptance of them as truth. That causes a lot of pain. So here in, in this place, what we're doing is we're saying these false beliefs are true, is what we're saying there. Right? We believe false beliefs are true. And the problem with believing things that are true or not true is you start doing things and acting upon them as if they're true when they're not. And we do it with ourselves. So the trouble is we do it with ourselves first, which in, in the first group we said that's one of the most damaging things you can do to yourself, is it not? Because if you lie to yourself, how can you change anything? You can't. You can't make adjustments. It's, the, it's one of the most difficult things to correct, a lie that you've told yourself. One of the most difficult things to correct. And then, of course, we also lie to others. And then, as a subsequent result of that, we also obviously lie to God as well. And we have no understanding, really, about how painful that is. You know, lies told to a child can have a long-term effect on that child for the rest of its life on earth. Like if you tell a lie to a child, for example, you tell the child that it's not worth anything and you re reinforce that through your behaviour, you, you treat your child like it's not worth anything, that child is going to grow up believing it's not worth anything and engage in a whole heap of conduct where it believes it's not worth anything for a long period of time until it changes. Just one lie. Just one lie. Terrible effect on the child. Terrible effect. And you, you know, you can multiply this by how many times are we taught all sorts of things, and often contrary things. And often one parent tells us one thing and the other parent tells us the opposite thing. At the same time, how confusing is that? Like we know that with men I have some worth, but with women I have no worth. Because mum taught me that I have no worth, but with dad he taught me I had some worth. And so with men I feel I have worth and with women I feel I have none. We, we, and then we get confused. So sometimes when we're around women we go, oh, I feel like, like I've got no worth here and you act like you've got no worth and you do a whole heap of things that, that indicate that. And then when you're with men you're okay. You feel like you've got worth and you treat them as equals. Like how confusing is that for you? Then you've got to work out why is it that with women I'm one way and with men I'm a different way. Well, it's because of how we've been treated and how the lies have settled within us as truth. They've become a part of our very psyche, of our very nature. What's next? If we come across to Tara. Accepting doubt, cynicism, uh, scepticism, mistrust as truth from others. Yes. Now, what these all, all these qualities, doubt, cynicism, scepticism, what are they? Well, they're fears, but, but they're opposite to one other quality, faith. faith. They're the opposite to faith. So can you see how you could say that all of the qualities that are the opposite to faith of, have been reinforced inside of me, and faith has basically been destroyed as a result of that. So as a result of that, I am cynical and so forth. Doubt, I doubt. I don't trust anybody and so forth. Now all of those are the opposite to this other quality, which is faith. So in other words, I've got a whole heap of inbuilt things inside of me that cause me to not have faith. And because I have those, I act upon them. So someone comes along and gives me a gift, and what do I do? I go, oh, I don't know whether it's a gift. Maybe they want something. Someone gives me a gift, and I go, huh, what are they, what's going on for them? You know, like, we're so cynical, and that prevented us from receiving the gift. Some, someone wants to do something good for us, and we're cynical about it. Now, most of you have treated me like that for the last eight years without you being aware. I want to give you a gift, a gift of you enjoying God's love and knowing how to do that. And you've been cynical, you, you know, the Jesus thing, you're still not over it, and so forth, right? So, so 
this is an indication that this cynicism, the doubt, the mistrust is driving a lot of pain. It causes you to step back and go, I don't know if I can trust this. Now the problem with that is that when we go like that with God, I don't know I can trust this, I don't know, I need to be cynical about God, can you see straight away that affects the very first of these pains? And can you see my relationship with God now is not even tried. We don't even attempt it. We don't even want to go for it. We're cynical about it. We mistrust that it's even possible. And, and as a result of that, we don't engage a relationship with God. And to be frank, for the majority of us, we barely engage relationships with others. Do we not? We're cynical about almost everything. You know, oh, men are like that. Women are like that. You know, the interplay between the genders is all based upon mistrust, cynicism, doubt, doubt that it can be different. You know, women are from Mars. Uh, men are from Mars. <laughs> women are from Venus. The whole concept is a concept flawed and full of cynicism, doubt, and mistrust. Okay. Um, is what you're saying that, like, when it becomes a habit, then we tend to apply it to things we shouldn't be cynical about. Like what, well, like you said, God. You don't need to be cynical about anything. Like the world is full of scammers and deceivers and untruth and falsity and yep. all that sort of stuff. And we need some sort of discrimination to be able to... Cynicism doesn't protect you from that. Truth protects you from that. See, we believe cynicism protects us. This is part of our problem with cynicism and doubt. We believe it's protecting us. It doesn't protect us. A child, a child has very little cynicism and doubt. As a result, it's very happy. As we grow up to be an adult, we have a huge amount of cynicism and doubt. And as a result, we're very unhappy. Right? But what happened to the child to cause it to grow up to be an adult with cynicism and doubt? Well, as a child, it was treated unlovingly, untruthfully. It was lied to. That's what's created it, cynicism, doubt. Does that make sense? Cynicism, doubt, mistrust are all emotions driven by the unhealed emotional condition of what happened at the child level. But they don't protect you. In fact, the law of attraction will state that you'll attract events that cause you to have cynicism and doubt in order for you to release the emotion. So actually, they make your life even worse. So what's wrong with like the Christian approach where they talk about faith and trust and stuff and yet there are plenty of scammers who target Christians specifically because they know they're gullible? The Christian faith is a scam. <laughs> and I know that's speaking strongly, but it is. And I forewarned about it in the first century. I said that people would come along claiming to have a relationship with God. They would go, Lord, Lord, did we not do this in your name? And did we not do that in your name? And, and I say to them, look, I never knew you. Get away from me. You're workers of lawlessness. In other words, you break God's laws all the time. So, so how are you going to actually measure what's good for you and what's not? By knowing who is breaking God's laws. That's how you do it. Not by cynicism and doubt. Or even and, and you certainly don't do it by having cynicism and doubt in God's laws because that, that's the measure you have. That's the way you tell what somebody's motivations are. So I, if I can tell your motivations, if I can feel your feelings and I feel from you that you have no intention of following God's laws, I don't have to be cynical about it. I just say Graham's got no intention of following God's laws on this particular issue. So... so so if, when it comes to money, Graham might have a tr problem with following God's laws. And as soon as I know money is involved with Graham, I know I don't have to be cynical. It's just the truth. You have that emotion. That's what gonna is going to be the result. Yeah, but I'm not in that. Graham, can I stop you for a moment? Okay. Because you have an addiction to cynicism, doubt and mistrust. Absolutely. And, and even your questions now are being guided by that addiction. You do not want to learn to trust based upon truth. You believe holding a point of cynicism and doubt and mistrust is protecting you. And this is what I'm suggesting you have to give up. Like I can see in myself the bad right. things about it. We're now into the stories and okay. you, we need to stay on point here. 
<laughs> they're here, but I normally revise them to the Q&As. But um, we need to stay on point. And the point that I'm making with you is you are addicted to cynicism, doubt and mistrust. So many of your questions now are going to be guided by the fact that you're addicted to it. Do you follow me? And this is something that you need to come to understand about yourself. The point I'm trying to make is cynicism, doubt and mistrust cause you pain. You think they don't. Just like we think lies don't cause us pain, but they do. Just like that we think no relationship with God doesn't cause us pain, but it does. I'm beginning to see when it causes me pain. Yep. So I am sort of getting a feeling for what you're saying. Yep. But, but there's still the emotional intention inside of you to go, I want to argue with this. I want to fight with this. I don't want to give up cynicism. You see cynicism, doubt and mistrust as a protection, protective layer when it's actually driven by fear. A person who loves is not driven by fear, they're driven by truth. They can measure something as it's occurring in the moment without having to doubt that someone whose good intentions are actually bad. You don't need to do that. So a person who can feel your emotions accurately knows when your intentions are good and also knows when your intentions are bad. And now under those circumstances, you imagine if you knew when my intentions were good and you knew when my intentions were bad, could you see that there's no need to be cynical? You just know the instant it happens. I can feel his intentions are bad right now. Or I feel that his intentions are good right now. What I'm suggesting to you is your cynicism stops you from being able to measure that. And you can't measure it accurately. You think everybody should be not trusted. My cynicism stops me from being able to measure the truth. Measure the truth emotionally. So it's 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 getting in the way of my discrimination. Correct. It's driving your cynicism. Your cynicism is driving this inability. is driven by this inability to feel the real emotion of the individual and accurately assess it. When you can feel the actual emotion of the individual and accurately assess it, you will no longer be cynical. You will be you'll be measuring their exact condition in the moment. So okay. I don't need to be cynical with you. I know there's certain things where your intentions are very pure. I also know there's certain things where your intentions are not pure at all. I don't expect you to be pure when I know you're not going to be. I'm also not cynical about the things when you are pure. I know that you are. Does that make sense? Because you can measure those things emotionally. You have an inability to measure it because the injury is, the pain based injury is there. Does that make sense? But we need to move forward. Yep. Okay, so these particular things. Now, just one brief thing I need to mention because I'm a bit over time now. But one of the things, a brief thing I need to mention now is that this is pain that we've examined the type, some of the types of pain. And this list is not exhaustive, but the list is the primary types of pain that you will have inside of you and the list not being exhaustive means that you might discover others right so don't assume that it's just an exhaustive list but remember what suffering is we need to talk about suffering just for a minute suffering is the extended protection of pain Suffering occurs because we do not release our pain. And that's what kicks into suffering. So for the majority of us, we're not just having these pains anymore that we've listed, but we're actually suffering because of them. We're actually suffering physically, emotionally, spiritually because of our inability to release these types of pain from ourselves. This is the primary cause of our long-term suffering. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay, so that's the creation of my pain. Now, at this stage, there's still questions that you guys have, so we're going to do a Q&A next. So what we'll do now is we have a 10-minute break, so if we can come back at quarter to one. Is that right? Yep. Quarter to one, and we'll uh, get started on the Q&A on this subject.